All right. One of my favorite people, Pastor Mike, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Yo, the great Asha Wilkerson. I am honored <laughs> to be in your presence and thank you for the opportunity to just holler with you for a second. Well, I appreciate it. I know that you are a busy, busy, busy human being. And so I appreciate the few minutes that you were able to jump on and spend with us. So I'll just get right to it just so we can get right to the point. As you know, this this platform is for black and brown business owners, entrepreneurs looking to build a business and leave a legacy. And the reason why I find it important is that we just need to bolster our economic status in mm. this country, right? Mm. You got to have some money, participate in the systems, to change the systems, to create your own future and have some self-determination. As I have been walking, working with entrepreneurs more and more, and even just diving into my own story, we all have some kind of understanding about money, about finances, about what we are entitled to mm. receive. And you know, if we get too much, then maybe we're getting further and further away from that good human being, that good Christian, that good you know religious person. So I just wanted to shed some light on that conversation so we can begin to talk about some of the beliefs that maybe we've held for a while that are no longer serving us and maybe incorrect or unuseful interpretations from our foundation. So that's my long intro. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's certainly an important one. Um, I think much of what you said is totally right. Uh, we have been taught um, a way of engaging with money, with resources, um, with uh, creation, the, the you know the uh, ecosystem that uh, has literally contributed to, um, if not our our um, our death, literally, it has certainly caused mm -hmm. us to not have the ability to thrive. So this is a great conversation, and I'm glad to uh, offer my bootleg preacher uh, uh, <laughs> reflections to this whole thing. <laughs> Nothing bootleg about it. Very real, very practical, um, a great marriage of faith and practice, as you like to say. So I was telling my podcast editor about my idea for this episode, and she said, you know, she grew up in East San Jose, and she said she grew up poor. And she said one of the things that she would hear in church is that, you know, God loves the poor and that mm. the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And she said mm. now that she is running her own business and you know trying to amass some wealth and secure her financial future, she's thinking subconsciously, does God still love me if I'm no longer poor? Mm. You know? And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a really good question because yeah. a lot of times we hear messages that support us in our situation and then we start to move beyond that and the message doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So what is your take or what is your understanding about um, being a good Christian or God loving you more when you don't have money versus when you do have money? Well, it's clear that, uh, at least to me, and I hope it's clear to everyone who's listening that, you know, God's love um, for all of uh, creation, certainly for human beings, is not predicated on the amount of money you have or don't have. This idea that God loves the poor is true, uh, but it is not connected to you being poor. It is connected to you being created in the image of God, right? That God loves the poor, but God despises poverty because mm -hmm. poverty is a created kind of condition. It's a created system within, again, if we're just talking within kind of a theological framework, poverty mm -hmm. is a created condition within uh, a system of abundance that God creates mm -hmm. the world with enough for everyone to have what they need and a, a whole lot to be left over. Poverty is a result of a very few small number of people um, using greed and exploitation to create the conditions for the enough to become scarce. And so when, when, it's, when it's, the scripture says God loves the poor, it is an affirmation of the inherent value of those who are being victimized by the greedy among us. It is not the uh, sense that God uh, is, is consigning a whole group of people to poverty for their whole life. And that is then their lot in order to be loved by God. Right. I really appreciate that. And I think that's important to hear because, you know, black and brown folks, we're, our, our economic status is still tied so much and interwoven with race and, you know, dominant ideologies will keep 
a certain group at the bottom, right? Capitalism, for instance, um, you know, or just the way things are run in this country. But that is not where we have to stay in order to be good people or good, you know, followers of Christ or good religious people in general, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's important to keep making a real emphasis or distinction between uh, the idea that poverty and the poor are not the same thing. And Mm -hmm. and scripture is, is attempting to describe to its readers the values of the creator um, it is about reminding us that the earth, everything that's created in the earth is the Lord's. It is an act of abundance and generosity and that we who are human beings must reflect our own kind of stewardship of those same resources, right? As mm-hmm. being generous and sharing and not being exploitive. And I think that that for black and brown folks who have often been at the uh, in the position of exploitation, um, we are often not fully, um, you know, appreciative of the ways in which the systems of this world, the the um, the uh, you know greedy and the the elite forces have created a literally a multi generational um, kind of uh, ceiling of poverty. And I mm-hmm. think uh, the, the the scripture is always good news to the readers. And so the good news is that. Uh, our value is not connected to um, our bank account. And yet we are also told to be good stewards of everything we have, which means that we should be stewarding all of creation, which is in and of itself wealthy, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Enough, abundant. Right. And so right. um, I think it's really important to to sh- eschew or to shed some of those, uh, you know, I would call them bad, you know, theological teachings around money and, mm-hmm. and, and et cetera. Yeah, I agree. I like that. So you mentioned abundance. Um, Where is the line between having abundance and enough and having too much? Mm -hmm. Because there's so we've gotten past, okay, we don't have to be impoverished to be connected to God, right? That's a system. That's a structure that is designed and we don't have to stay there. But now if we're thinking about, okay, we are no longer in this position, we're growing and we're trying to build a business and trying to amass wealth. What is the guidance between doing too much and Mm -hmm. being a good steward to where your finances can grow and you can leave this legacy for the generations that come after you? You know, that's a, that's a fascinating and very, I would say kind of complicated question. I don't know that there's one answer to it. I think uh, we who are, you know, followers of Jesus or people who are attempting to be, you know, more religious centered, compassionate folks li- literally have to spend the rest of our lives wrestling with this question. Uh, mm-hmm. I think there are some general principles, though, that we could use as um, as markers along the way. Um, I, I think the first thing we ought to always say to ourselves is that, um, you know, Greed and exploitation must never be a part of our business model, right? right. Um, and that we should have values that are cooked and baked into how we are amassing wealth. Um, I think that there are also um, some clear kind of questions we should ask the kind of economic systems that are deeply informing the way in which we are amassing wealth. And so, you know, I don't believe that any of the economic systems that we talk about are inherently uh, more Christian than others, right? I don't think capitalism is more inherently Christian or biblical than socialism or Marxism or or social democracy, blah, 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 blah. But I do think all of these systems uh, should be interrogated for the outcomes they produce, And so if we are participating in a capitalistic economy, the question for us is, how can our participation in this economy um, afford us the opportunity to not um, amass wealth in ways that actually create the conditions for the systems of poverty? Right. Right. Um, And so I do believe that there are some ways for us to think about how do we ensure that we are paying fair wages? How do we ensure that we are extending to um, the workers those um, same benefits that we ourselves would like to have? Uh, What does it mean for us to 
uh, ensure that we are, you know, following labor laws and not trying to, you know, get out of, uh, you know, taxes and, you know, all of these different kinds of things. I think there are questions we have to ask ourselves. I think it's kind of hard to um, participate in a capitalistic economy uh, that is inherently, at least in this country, predatory um, Mm -hmm. and then like not wrestle with these questions about how do we build our businesses in ways that both can exist in this system, but not be overdetermined by this system. Does that make sense? Right. It does. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think all of us, and no matter what profession you're in, we all have to ask ourselves, even me as a pastor, like I can make a a conscious choice to preach a prosperity message because that Mm -hmm. is kind of like one way Christianity, unfortunately, in this country shows up reflective of a predatory capitalistic economy. Or I can say, That's probably not the most faithful expression of Christian preaching. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to attempt to teach something that actually has some more justice uh, impulses embedded in it. It doesn't take me off the hook, though, of having to still wrestle with the tug and pull of both of those things. And I would say the same thing to business owners and entrepreneurs. How you build your business will greatly determine the kind of outcomes that reflect the values that you hold. Right. I love that. And also just as a reminder to folks, I think we get confused because it's all matched together. Capitalism, religion, you know, poverty structures that that these things, the system in and of itself is not inherently good or bad. Capitalism is not good or bad. It is just a system, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that you are, or the way that people are participating in the system can lead to results or does lead to results that are, you know, quote unquote, good or bad. But by Mm -hmm. participating in capitalism doesn't make you inherently you know, a bad person, you can use capitalism to produce good results. And a friend of mine, a good friend of mine said, she's a, you know, don't forget, there's a difference between capitalism and brutal capitalism. So a lot of times when we're, you know, talking about uh, every election and there's, you know, something on the ballot about taxes and the, the folks who aren't benefiting from the big corporate tax breaks are looking at these big businesses, mostly led by white men and going, this is terrible, right? But those same tax benefits and breaks are available to any entrepreneur, any corporation, and it's not without getting into whether the tax break is good or bad, it is available. We just don't all know about it. It's not the tax break itself. That's necessarily the problem. It's like how it's applied. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I think, you know, we should make lots of distinctions along the way too. You know, one of the great biblical principles is about discernment, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like equity, the conversation about equity. It doesn't mean equal application. It means what is the uh, most appropriate application that levels the playing field related to um, uh, injustice, exploitation, or, you know, kind of historic exclusion. Mm-hmm. And so I do think we should always, you know, have great discernment and nuance when we're talking about, you know, small businesses versus like Fortune 500, you know, right. fifth generation billionaires, right? <laughs> like, right. I, think, I think, you know, an entrepreneur, someone who's just starting off will will likely never get to that level of wealth. Mm-hmm. And so we ought not, you know, um, you know, act with like these kinds of broad brush kind of, you know, uh, approaches. I think we should take care and be very intentional about continuously interrogating the ways in which we are uh, amassing wealth, you know, reminding ourselves that, you know, the the participation in the American capitalistic machine does have international implications that Mm -hmm. we may or may not be aware of. And so all of these things then require us to kind of have discernment about, so if I participate in this way, how do I, you know, ensure that I'm acting, you know, with charity and justice in this way, So I'm able to at least balance out or compensate some of these uh, realities, right? And so I do think it's really, really important for us as we're studying kind of all of these ways to amass wealth uh, that we don't do it all in a vacuum or in a silo. The interconnectedness Mm -hmm. of creation, of human beings, of, uh, you know, economic systems, of nations, of governments, of of the uh, ecosystem, all of this is something that we should... Um, be mindful of. It's 
probably, you know, irresponsible to suggest the entrepreneurs shall hold the weight of that by themselves. But right. you just want to be mindful of it and not not be willfully obtuse about it. Yeah, I, I like that as well. So in connection to that, you do a lot of work around social justice, a lot of uh, messaging around social justice and community organizing. And I believe that entrepreneurship is one of the tools we can use mm-hmm. as social justice warriors to create a more just society for the people mm-hmm. who are marginalized and left out. In your work as a community organizer and meeting with different pockets of folks across the nation, can you identify some ways that Black owned, Latinx owned, you know, margin like under uh, represented entrepreneurs can affect directly the communities that they are in to merge this? I'm taking care of myself and helping my family and myself, but also I'm having an impact on the community that is also good and just and, you know, serving a purpose. Oh, such a great question. And so I think it's always important for us to remember, particularly folks, black or brown, coming from, you know, historically disenfranchised and marginalized communities, that uh, we are literally standing on the shoulders of the people who came before us, that those who were picking cotton or laboring in the fields, um, have, were literally doing so with us in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they were hoping that there would be a time where we could move without as much restriction um, so we could secure a future for our families and our communities um, and allow us to not be dependent upon the goodwill of the political and economic white elite system. And so all of if all of that is true, and I certainly believe it is true, then I do believe that as we fight for justice, there is always an economic component to that justice fight. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it is often, um, you know, underappreciated the amount of folks who are able, particularly with criminal convictions and criminal records, uh, who are able to get hired by uh, yeah. black and brown entrepreneurial groups because we all appreciate the journey that most have had to make in the last mm-hmm. 30 or 40 years since the war on drugs ravished our communities and put so many of our loved ones uh, under the surveillance of the state, either through incarceration, electronic mon- monitoring, et cetera. And so what does it mean, right, to to intentionally create, you know, business and, and, and um, a sector that allows there to be this on-ramping from a tech perspective, from a a service perspective, from Mm -hmm. a mental health perspective, from a legal perspective, et cetera, et cetera, a financial services perspective. What does it mean for us to create these pathways to employment that afford at least, you know, an entry level position or even a career long pathway for individuals in our communities who are likely not going to get the similar kind of opportunity? Right now, we are super, you know, committed in pulling down about $5 billion from the federal government Mm -hmm. to support, um, you know, the the public health responses to gun violence and mass incarceration. And so this is a whole sector. It's a multi-billion dollar sector of work uh, that will need folks who are able to do art and able to uh, do financial management and teaching classes, able to uh, do um, therapeutic and mental health support and uh, drug and alcohol and addiction and you know, coding and, and, and legal services and on and on targeting this particular mm-hmm. population. Right. So I do think folks in, in, in the entrepreneurial space should think about how can my business model have a portion of it that draws down on the kind of social justice or social entrepreneurship models. So as I am kind of stabilizing my own, say nuclear family, quote unquote, I'm mm-hmm. also stabilizing my whole community at the same time. Right. Yeah. I think it's really important. Oftentimes we feel that I'll speak from my own experience. When I graduated law school, it's like, oh, do I go back and work in the community at this nonprofit organization that's only going to pay $50,000 a year and do good work, but in the struggle mm-hmm. or do, and my dad told me, he was like, if you don't figure out how to take care of yourself, you're going to need the services like everybody else you're trying to serve. And I was like, you know, <laughs> you, might, you might have a point, right? So oftentimes we have this this rub, this internal conflict uh, as folks of color, do we leave, quote unquote, the community to secure our well-being and and to meet our immediate needs? Or do we stay in and fight, which is a good fight, but then 
unfortunately, we're asked to give up, you know, economic stability. So Mm -hmm. if we are able to create those systems, those businesses that have an eye towards, you know, empowering the community, creating more jobs, you know, hiring the disenfranchised, we will no longer have to make that choice to leave outside of the community and find financial stability versus staying in and foregoing financial stability. Yeah. And I think there are multiple ways to to help provide that kind of stability that doesn't necessarily require um, you in your kind of infancy phase uh, to um, feel the financial burden, right? Like the skill set most entrepreneurs have would be a blessing to um, the social justice sector by serving on boards or by volunteering or by doing Mm -hmm. free trainings. And you do a lot of that, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, people need skills. People need to be exposed to knowledge and information. And so I certainly think that creating business is certainly one way, but business is a result of knowledge, right? It's a result Mm -hmm. of skills and talents and passions. And so I would encourage folks to think beyond just the kind of nuts and bolts of nickels and dimes, right? It's about like, how do we use our businesses, our entrepreneurship kind of sensibilities, our intellectual rigor, um, how do we use all of that to create an ecosystem of stability and knowledge transfer that cr- produces and multiplies wealth? And uh, I think that is another way perhaps folks can think about, you know, plugging in to some of the mm-hmm. fights that are happening. Um, you know, I often say you can donate, you can uh, advocate or you can participate. Right. You put mm-hmm. some tap on it. There's three ways. And so you can do all of that <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, that's important, right? Because again, that that rub, it seems to be just a dichotomy. You can do either this or that, but there are so many more options to participate and to make an impact that don't require, they don't have to be self-sacrificial, which is, you know, what we're taught oftentimes that they have to be. Um, All right, moving into the third area. uh, And what was my third area? Um, oh, let's talk about, you know, this the political context right now and um, the idea that Jesus was this pacifist. And if we are, you know, good believers and faithful people that we we don't participate in this political realm and we just try and keep the peace. You mm-hmm. know, from my understanding, Jesus was quite revolutionary and spoke mm-hmm. out against the empire mm-hmm. and stood on behalf of the poor and the under-resourced and the marginalized and was uh, very clear about the message that about things that were unjust. So mm-hmm. how do we recon- reconcile this, this modern day Jesus with what your understanding of, you know, the historical Jesus was? Well... You know, this is um, this is such a a fascinating conversation um, to have because I think um, Jesus is arguably one of the most uh, misrepresented uh, figures in history uh, in the Western kind of civilization. Um, I, I'm gonna start with me personally and then try to you know make a connection to how I think Jesus should be understood. As a pastor, um, I have to provide spiritual leadership and um, support to hundreds of individuals who I tell regularly, I love them, I care for them, I want to see them thrive and safe and healthy, et cetera. And Mm -hmm. when members of my congregation uh, come and share with me that their son is being unfairly singled out in school and expelled or their daughter is uh, being victimized by sexism or misogyny, or uh, their father is being brutalized by the police, or their auntie is uh, getting, um, you know, com- constantly um, raided by ICE looking for uh, her husband who may not be documented. As someone who says, I love these folks, I cannot just sit there and not respond to them. My response right. is an act of love, is an act of compassion. It is an act of my responsibility to the people that I feel called to serve. Well, Jesus literally was born in an empire that had his people at the bottom of the social ladder. Mm-hmm. And they were constantly experiencing violence by the 
hands of the police of their day. They were constantly experiencing violence at the hands of the political systems of their day. Um, they certainly did not have the ability uh, to fully um, uh, uh, live into their um, their their God given say dignity, etc. And so Jesus comes certainly as a divine figure, but certainly in a human context and and approaches people at the place of their need and speaks directly to both their spiritual and their human reality. And I think it's very it's very difficult in the Western church where uh, too often, uh, particularly after the 1600s or so, the, the scriptures have been used to to make uh, a moral cover for imperialism and genocide and domination, right? For folks to fully understand or appreciate that Jesus is not just a prince of peace during Christmas time, right? Right. <laughs> like, like, you know, it didn't say, and he shall be called the prince of peace during Christmas. No, it, it's like, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifelong eternal description of the ways of Jesus. The Western church, which has unfortunately been privy and complicit to so much of the kind of, um, you know, warmongering, et cetera, uh, imperializing of the world, the Western church has turned Jesus uh, into the Lord of war, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important for us uh, to, to imagine that the work of Jesus, you know, across time, across place, but particularly in his particular uh, human life, was reflecting a need to care for the people that he would call the least of these. That is what justice mm-hmm. is about. It's about having a consciousness that there are systems in this world that literally exploit the weak and the vulnerable among us. Some of the weak and vulnerable among us are socially placed in this way, not because of something they've done wrong themselves, but because they've been born into a poverty situation or they have too much melanin in their skin or they uh, are gendered differently Mm -hmm. in a, in a context where uh, power is ascribed and, and uh, bequeathed to others and and not all. And so I do believe it's really important for us to um, again, keep interrogating how we understand Jesus. And I would say any religious faith, like I do think it's really, really important for us to remember that, the best that our religious traditions have to offer us are always about fairness and justice and inclusion and equity. Um, it speaks very clearly against uh, the the greed and the violence and the, the 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 theft of the wealthy and the rich. And we ought to make sure we do not, you know, find ourselves named in those kinds of uh, categories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So if you were listening today and you had some questions about how your faith can uh, intermingle, intermix with your desire to, you know, create generational wealth, I hope that this conversation has shed some clarity on that, that there is nothing wrong with being a believer in Christ and building a business. There are also ways that you can carry out missions of social justice and access and fairness through your business without having to sacrifice, you know, your own financial gain. There are ways to participate in this system that are representative of, you know, the tenets of faith that talk about justice, that talk about access, that talk about reaching the poor, um, that talk about just being good stewards of what we are given and, you know, the ability to grow and to have more because there is is abundance in this world. There's enough for all of us. That's what I always say. Switch from that scarcity mindset to that abundance mindset. There is enough. And you as an entrepreneur, especially black, brown, BIPOC, you know, queer entrepreneur have so much opportunity to make your impact on the world, whether it is just with the clients you serve in your neighborhood, in your state, in your nation, or in the world. So go forward and, you know, do what you do. Let us know if you have any questions, need some support. We will be happy to support you. Pastor Mike, if they want to check into you a little bit more and find out where, where you hang out, can you tell them where to find you? Sure. Um, you can go to my website, pastormikemcbride.com, and it has all the links to the church, our church in the Bay Area, the way Berkeley, um, the national campaigns we lead called the Live for USA campaign, uh, the Black Brown Peace Consortium, and the Black Church Pack. Uh, you can go to PastorMikeMcBride.com and you'll get plugged in. I'm on all the social media channels. My uh, handle is 
I'm Pastor Mike underscore. I am Pastor Mike underscore. And uh, yeah, follow me. You'll you'll hear all kind of ongoing radical uh, 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 rants from uh, the bootleg priest. <laughs> <laughs> the messages that we need to hear to empower us and to meet us right where we are. I appreciate you, Pastor Mike. Thank you so much. I love Asha. You are the bomb diggity. Thanks for all you do for the world. <laughs> Thank you.